<clears throat> so this is uh, the title of my talk, what is an axiom, uh, which is a very general question. I have been working on this subject uh, since uh, many years. I was thinking about this uh, topic since many years. And then uh, I, decided to, I decided to write a paper on that. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a quite uh, broad uh, question. Uh, as a logician, mathematician, philosopher, I'm very interested in this uh, topic. And uh, I would say as a paper, I already, uh, already wrote a paper uh, that which is uh, available, but uh, well, I think it's only a first draft of something that I can develop in the future. So it's some general ideas. It's a quite a short paper because it's like uh, 15 pages some general ideas that can be uh, developed furthermore. So this paper is, has been published in a book uh, dedicated to my colleague here, Frio Janeiro Francisco Doria, who has been working uh, on the axiomatization of uh, <laughs> physics. That's why I choose this topic, because uh, if we want to write something for a first trip book, it has to be connected with the work of the people, of the guy who is on earth. So uh, let me first say uh, a few words about my uh, methodology, the methodology I'm using here, which is not only for this uh, paper, but uh, that I'm using to, to develop uh, thinking about different uh, topics. So four dimensional, I will explain. But first, uh, as we can see, um, uh, axiom, we can say, well, it's a word, like many, it's like many things. It's a just, it's a word, it's a word. We start with word. But uh, um, some words are different from other words. So if, you, if, if we have a look at axioms, at, at, the, at this word axiom in uh, different languages, we will see that it's always, it's nearly all, always the same word here. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, we have some tools <coughs> that are quite useful on, on the internet. And you see that here, this is all the entries about Axiom on Wikipedia. And uh, 90, nearly 99 uh, of this uh, of the translation of the word Axiom is Axiom, with, a, of course, an adaptation to the alphabet, in, in, like in Russian. Uh, or something, uh, small change, but the word is always the same. So it's like the word is not translated. Uh, we, we can say something like that. The word is never translated. There is no translation of this word. So, so the word is, this word is beyond any kind of specific language. Well, we can say, well, uh, then we can ask, but do we have to stick to the Greek world? Because uh, uh, everybody knows that it's, it's a Greek world. So is, it, is this Greek word so important? Well, what we can, what we can say is that um, it's, it's important because uh, there is no something equivalent in another language. That's why it's not translated. And it's the same of uh, other words uh, which are connected to the word axiom, which uh, are the word logic and mathematics. So it's, in some sense, it uh, works, this word works like a proper name, we can say. Now, uh, what I want to say is that I'm not only interested in the world, of course. Uh, I, am, I have been developing this uh, semiotic theory of a pyramid of meaning, as you can see here. When we have a world, we have the idea corresponding to the world. We have the object, the reality of the world, and then we have the well, something which is at the top of the pyramid, which is a notion. And what I call a notion is uh, considering these three aspects, <coughs> world, thing, and idea, together. So we will. Uh, I'm not when we, when we are talking about the notion of axiom, and this is what I want to talk today. Uh, we, if we are talking about the notion of axiom, we are not only talking about the world. We are not only talking about the, the reality of uh, corresponding to this uh, world, and we are not only talking about the idea beyond the world. We are considering all these three 
three aspects together. Now this, um, how to investigate, uh, that's the question, how we can investigate a notion? Well, searching for a definition, the question of definition is important. Understanding the relation of this notion with other notions. So this kind of structuralist approach because we want to connect things together. Investigating the use of this notion, how people are using this notion. And um, the fourth point is making a theory that will fix and clarify its meaning. I will not exactly propose here a theory about that, but we can go to uh, this direction because we just we don't want to have something which is purely descriptive, you know, making an, an enumeration of the the way that uh, this notion was presented by different people. We want to understand what is uh, what is uh, axiom. We want to understand, and when we are doing that, we will, we in some sense uh, uh, we need to fix and clarify the meaning of, okay. So we start, this is the methodology, we start with a general meaning. Uh, so, so as I was saying, we don't want to make a descriptive approach to have a really a big enumeration of the, the various ways uh, the world was uh, used, defined and so on. But what we can do is to have a look, to choose some basic, a definition, some quotations, some thinking about axiom, because we have to take in account what people, uh, what people are considering, uh, what is uh, the idea that people are thinking when they are thinking about an axiom, how this notion was thought, and so on. So we have to take this in consideration. We have to make a selection of this uh, to to start with. We have to make a selection to have a general idea of how this uh, notion is understood, has been understood and is, in, un, is uh, understood right now. So uh, if we, um, I have selected here in the paper, there are more things, but here, here since the talk is shorter, so I have uh, selected three uh, definition on a different uh, dictionary, which um, has a basic uh, definition of axiom you can find. So a self-evident truth that requires no proof, a universally accepted principle or rule. And then there is some more technical stuff here with the consequence, uh, but this, this is the basic definition. Now you have something like, uh, <clears throat> so this is what this definition here in this dictionary is quite uh, formal. Now this, this second definition is the one that you can find in Cambridge Dictionary. They make um, also something very similar, something which is accepted to true, uh, generally accepted to, to be true, but need not be so. Okay, a formal statement of principal mathematics from which over statement can be obtained. It's quite the same. Now the third uh, definition, also you, we can find uh, similar things, but maybe here there is something new comparing to the other two definition, is a third definition, a maxim widely accepted on, on its intrinsic merit, the axioms of wisdoms. So it's something less formal than uh, axiom in the mathematical senses. And we can find this variation of, these variations of meanings uh, if we look at some uh, quotation, quotes by uh, famous people. Um, like this one by Amazon Church, which is uh, one of the most famous uh, logic logician in the 20th century. The only thing that might have annoyed the mathematician was the presumption of assuming that maybe the axiom of choice could fail and that we, we should look into contrary assumption. Well, it's axiom of choice, I will talk about axiom of choice later on. So it's, then we see that the axiom, axiom in this sense is not something completely absolute, but there is some truth that people want to justify and they are searching to do that. Now there is a, this interesting quote, quote by Einstein uh, about, which is more related bit for, uh, it's related to the empirical science. It's interesting to see uh, that Einstein has this idea that uh, we can axiomatize uh, physics. 
not only physics, because you say, well, the grand aim of all science is to cover biological deduction from them. Well, so we see that as, at some point, it's, I don't think it's the case. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's still the case uh, at this time. But in the first half of the 20th century, people had this idea that uh, everything in science, so we are, we are here in a general meeting about science, that's axioms, uh, hypothesis or axioms, no? axioms are the foundation of any science. So the, if we want to, uh, if we want to think uh, what, if we want to ask the question, what is science, then uh, the notion of axiom is fundamental in science. This was the perspective of the first half of the 20th century, which was a great time for science. Nowadays, uh, people don't know. They, they, don't, they, don't, they, they don't know what to say. It's not clear. Science nowadays, it's, uh, it's kind of confused. Uh, we, there is not anymore this idea that we can find some axiom deduced from things. Mm -hmm. So it's nowadays, uh, science is a bit confused, you can say. Well, here uh, also a quotation by uh, Leibniz. Which also it's, uh, it's, just, it's the same spirit, it's very general. Yeah, it's also for every uh, science. And then uh, we have uh, the last quotation here for today. It's a quotation more general by a, a famous um, writer, uh, Gustav Flaubert where we, the word axiom, to, to, just to emphasize that this word axiom is also used in a more broad sense. Huh? The, you can establish, uh, it, you could almost establish that as an axiom that the subject is irrelevant, style itself being an absolute manner of seeing things. So this is uh, the sense of axiom that, uh, well, we want to go to, to, want to find some truth, to do something. And that's, that's something, that's a, a very general principle, which does not reduce only to science. It's a, it's a very uh, interesting to, to point out that, that the word axiom, uh, even if it started to be used in mathematics, it's, it's general meanings, it's, it's general meaning, also is, uh, it has a meaning which is make, make sense out, outside of uh, mathematics, outside of uh, science, as we can see here. Oh, oh what, one more. Uh, so uh, by John Searle, whatever is referred to must exist. Let us call this the axiom of existence. So it's kind of principle you know, some the, from which one may want to develop some ideas. Well, and then, um, we can uh, once we have uh, once we had uh, had a look at all this uh, definition, quotation, and so on, we can make a cloud. The cloud is something which has been uh, been developed uh, these last years by computation and so on. I mean, you can use a small program that uh, make a cloud in the sense that they, they put the world together in some in some direction. So I, I use this this program. Uh, so I, I enter these different words, you can, as you can see, these different words, and um, well, we have this cloud. We can make different clouds. The idea to make a cloud, to make a cloud, is to uh, relate this, uh, to make association, to make association of notion make an association between notions. It's not only a question of words, different notions. So it's interesting to have a look, not maybe to have too many uh, notions, but like, let's see, 10 notions, which are frequently associated with the notion of axiom, like, like this here, you can find. Hypothesis, postulate, evidence, proof. And then someone may ask, but then what is, a, what is a relation and what is the difference between an axiom and an hypothesis? Maybe there is no difference, you know, then, then uh, when we are talking about that, 
we have to uh, make a theory. We will decide if really uh, there are there are two there are two different worlds, axiom and hypothesis. But do we have two different notions beyond these two worlds? I think that's an important, very important question. Okay. And also, it's interesting to have a negative approach. Negative approach is a negative approach. What is not an axiom? It's, uh, it's a way, uh, interesting way to understand the situation. So uh, I have chosen three cases here of things which are not axioms, which cannot really, that we cannot really say that's axioms. Tomatoes are not potatoes. Okay, two plus two is four. And then you have a, a, a formula in first order logic, which is um, the kind of negation of um, transitivity. Yes. Then why uh, I will say, well, why I will say that these three uh, cases are not axioms. Because an axiom is not a simple truth. So two plus two is four. It's not uh, an axiom because maybe it's true, but what can, what you, what can you do with that? So an axiom is something that leads you somewhere to be useful as a principle of action or deduction. If you say two plus two is four, then and what you what 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 can you do with that? That's the reason it's not uh, um, an axiom. So we have to make a clear difference between truth, even uh, simple truth evidence, because as you see before, I I was presenting these definitions. Uh, I say people it's people say well, an axiom is something. It's an obvious uh, truth. It's something which is evident. So it's not true. Not everything which is obvious is an axiom. So when we start to investigate, we see that this definition that you can find in, uh, in general dictionary are wrong because they say only part of the truth, half of the truth, and half of the truth is not the truth, if I may say, half of the, the truth of the, the meaning of which define the meaning of axiom. So it's not, uh, uh, we can say that uh, it's a necessary condition for something to be an axiom to be in some sense true, but it's not sufficient. It's not, it's not because something is, uh, is obvious that it is an axiom. And uh, regarding the third cases, uh, we need to have something which is pretty general. So something which is negative, like uh, the negation of transitivity, it's not general. You just say something negative and something negative is very particular. So general, generally, an axiom is not uh, something which is negative. It's something which is positive and which is universal. That's the idea of an axiom, to have universality. So you can see here in this um, formula, you don't have universal quantifier, only existential quantifier. Okay. Let's go. Uh, now to uh, to study two examples of uh, axioms. First of all, I will I will start with something which is outside of the field of uh, science and mathematics. I think it's interesting to do so. So the Zurich axioms. Zurich axioms is the title of a book which was written by Max Günther. You see his photograph here. And uh, is there is he, when he, he was born when you died. So this book is became very famous. Uh, so it's interesting because it's a book which is very famous outside of the field of mathematics and science, using this word axiom. And uh, very famous. Why? Because it's related with uh, business money, so, as we know. Money is very popular, so it's interesting to see why and what, what does it mean to use this word in this context, in the context of business. So as you can see in the subtitle of the book, the rules of risk and reward used by generation of Swiss bankers. So axiom is 
here is, in, is understood as a rule, kind of rule. So we have to examine this, to examine the situation, the relation between axiom and rule. So here in the, it's a brief description of, um, which is an introduction of the book, uh, where the author explic, he tried to, to explain why this terminology was used. But as you can see, uh, well, he says that nobody really remember why this terminology was used. Nobody remember why, who, who chose the terminology and why exactly they, 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 they choose it. But as you see in the last part, the, but that is a name by which the rules came to be known. So it's rules, some rules. Why to call rules, why, why to call a rule an axiom? I think the word axiom is stronger than the word, than the word rule. It's something which is stronger, more impressive than uh, the word uh, rule. But it's interesting to, to, to see the connection between axiom and rule. The meaning, I mean, the meaning of these two words. Uh, axiom is something stronger. That's what can, that we, what we can say. Then we can uh, think, we can try to understand why it is stronger. So I will give you just three examples of these uh, axioms of this book. When the ship starts to sink, don't pray, jump. So it's like a rule that you will apply. Another rule is always play for the meaningful stakes. And a third example is that chaos is not dangerous until it begins, it begins to look odd. It's more like uh, some rules, some principles that you will apply in business, but you know, it's not, also, it's not uh, necessarily uh, also um, restricted to business. It's something very, something very general. So we see again, the importance of uh, the generality. Because if you if you say this free, if you if you say this free sentences, these free axioms, we, without saying that it's related with banking, well, people say, well, it's some principle to just to behave in life, not necessarily uh, strictly related with business. Okay, now let's go to axiom of choice. Uh, I chose this axiom of choice because it's one of the most famous axioms. Uh, in modern time, modern time. But uh, this axiom is very ambiguous because the name choice, why it was why 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 it was called choice, is completely ambiguous because it's not related with choice as we understood this world uh, as we understand this world in daily life, like choosing between two uh, paths or two profession, what you what you will do in your life and something like that. Well, the um, action of choice is not about that. So that's why uh, its meaning is not clear because uh, the name, the, the, pro, the name of this uh, axiom is not, was not uh, well chosen, if I may say, choice chosen. It was not a good choice to call this action of choice, action of choice. It has nothing to do with the choice as we understand it in everyday life. That's the first point. Now, what is the axiom of choice? Well, how we, can how we can understand this axiom, the, the, the difficulty of this axiom is that it has many different formulations, many different formulations, more than hundreds of different formulations, and all these formulations have a different meaning. They have a different, this, each of these formulations has a different meaning. So that's why it's difficult to, to say, well, actually, is this, Exactly this. Well, you can you can try to find uh, one of formulation which is maybe more intuitive. But if you consider the one of the most famous formulation, which is a uh, zone lemma, well, it's something that um, you can understand if you if you if you are working in the theory of order or thing like that, you know. And you see that here. Uh, you, you don't, uh, in this formulation, in the zone lemma, you, you don't see the question of choice. You know? it's, it's a question of Uber bound. If each, uh, if for every, every chain we have an upper bound, there is one maximal element. So 
what, what, what is the choice here? It's not a question of choice. Now, uh, there is an interesting formulation of this uh, formulation of this axiom, uh, which was um, studied by a Brazilian uh, mathematician. It's on far. It proves that uh, the axiom of choice is equivalent to general distributivity of conjunctional activity to disjunction. So, distributivity, something rather simple to understand. So that's a way to understand what is the axiom of choice. Now, uh, the question of the axiom of choice is interesting in the, in the question of the philosophy of axiom because we want to, uh, when, we are, when we have an axiom, we want to have something which is true, which is strong, true, obvious. So the axiom of choice, can we say the axiom of choice is obvious, is true? Well, we have to find a good uh, intuition about it like uh, I was saying about this one, by the distributivity. And uh, you can also try to derive this axiom from over more elementary axioms. This, this is what people have tried to do, but the result was negative, as it is known, because the axiom of choice is independent of the most famous set theory, uh, uh, of the most fam famous axiomatic set theory, Zermola Funker. So this means the fact that the axiom of choice is independent it means that you cannot reduce it to some basic idea about sets. Okay. That's what we can say about the axiom of choice. Now let me um, explain, um, uh, try to explain, uh, to understand, uh, let's try to understand what is an axiom, making a relation between this notion and other notion. As I was saying, it's one of the main points of my approach to make a structuralist approach that we want to connect things, connect notions. So I will present two trinities uh, of uh, related with axiom. The first trinity is definition, axiom, and proof. Sure, the def definition, axiom, and proof. This one is a kind of a basic uh, trinity that was uh, clearly uh, presented by Blaise Pascal in his famous uh, little book about geometry. So uh, you have rules for definition, rule for axiom, rule for proof. So axiom, or the notion of axiom, this notion comes together with these two other notion, definition and proof. It does not work alone, does not work alone. So you have axiom, and then from axiom, you make some proof. You, you will use this axiom to derive some, some things. Now, the relation between axiom and definition is not clear. It's not, not completely clear. Up to now, can we say that uh, an axiom is a definition or not? It's something that still has to be investigated. At this time, uh, and I think it's still the situation, in uh, mathematics in general, people are making a difference between uh, a definition and an axiom because, well, you say, what is a circle? So you say a circle is a line where every point has the same distance from the center. Okay, that's a circle. So we have a definition of circle. And this is clearly different from an axiom. You are defining an object. Sure. So definition are clearly different from axioms. On the other hand, you can say that an axiom is defining something. That's the question. So maybe uh, from this point of view, we can say, well, axiom is a particular case of, uh, an axiom is a particular case of definition. Maybe we can understand uh, the relation of these two notions from this point of view. But when you are using an axiom, you are not defining a specific object. You are defining a structure, a class of structure. I think that's the main difference between axiom and definitions. Now the second uh, trinity is uh, axiom proof and truth. And it's a trinity which is quite different from this, the first one because it's a trinity which was promoted by, uh, in modern logic. Uh, so in modern logic, we have a, a clear difference between proof and truth. So proof, you have the idea of formal proof 
which is uh, similar to this idea of, of Blaise Pascal or, or very traditional mathematics. You have some basic definition axiom, and from that, you want to deduce something. Okay. So that's axiom from the point of proof. Now, the axiom from the point of point of view of truth is something rather different. You know, it's something like you have an axiom and you have some models for uh, these axioms. So this uh, idea of models uh, was developed only systematically only in the 20th century through the work of Tarski in model theory. But already at the beginning, uh, because Tarski work is only in the 50s, but already at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a work, uh, famous work by, by Hilbert about axiomatization of geometry and so on. So these two perspectives were already clearly distinguished and people wanted to make a connection between the two. And this was done by uh, the completeness theorem uh, result due to Kurt Gödel, which is one of the most important results of uh, modern logic, connecting two different things, two different, two different understanding, two different understandings of the notion of axiom. Okay. Let me say a few words about the model theoretical notion of axiom, uh, which is not so well known in some sense. Huh? Uh, so what is a model theoretical vision? Well, we have some propositions, some statements, and we have a reality corresponding to that. Well, this is for mathematician. It's uh, quite obvious if uh, we think about abstract modern mathematics. Sure. Because if, if, if you think about like a theory of groups, a theory of groups, which is one of the most famous uh, theory of modern mathematics, Groups, you have axioms, then you have axiom for groups. And this axiom in a theoretical, in a model theoretical sense, this is not axiom in the sense of uh, proof. Because uh, you, you, this, these, these axioms are the base, the basis of a theory that you want, uh, uh, the basis of a reality you want to investigate. The groups, all these groups, what are they, this group, or what are the different between groups and so on. So your idea is not that you want to deduce something from this axiom, is that you want to examine different kind of reality using these axioms. So these are rather different uh, perspectives. So you can, uh, you can go in two directions. You want to catch something like uh, the natural numbers, axiomatization of the natural numbers. So you want to catch a specific structure with your axioms. On the other hand, you, can, you, you may just want to catch a notion like the notion of order. You want to, make the, you want to catch a notion of order, and then you are not catching, you, want, you don't want to catch a specific uh, structure, but you want to catch a, a class of structure. Well, we have uh, two uh, important results about this uh, axiomatization, the question of axiomatization in modern logic. <clears throat> there is a result by uh, Torah's column showing that uh, we always have, we always have no standard model of arithmetic. So we cannot find uh, some axiom which characterize the structure of natural numbers. You can construct no standard models. And there is uh, the result of Kudel, which is so very famous, that you cannot uh, make a proof theoretical approach axiomatization of the natural numbers, you cannot find some axiom from which you will deduce all the truth about natural numbers. So this is two a negative result about axiomatization that we have in uh, modern logic. Now in the case of uh, physics, we also have some generalization of these results. So Doya, uh, to whom this uh, paper is dedicated, with Newton Lacosta, he proved the incompleteness of classical, classical mathematics and over some over physical theories in the sense that you cannot find some axiom which characterize this theory, uh, this structure of reality, if we, if we may say. And uh, there is also a famous uh, result by uh, Gödel showing that Einstein theory admits non-rotating universe as model. So it means that Einstein theory has different kind of models which are incompatible, incompatible 
uh, between each other. Uh, there are uh, some models in which the time is circular, and there are some models in which the time is not circular. So the question is not to, to say, well, is it wrong or not to have the time circular or not? The fact is if this theory of Einstein doesn't characterize some single thing. It characterizes different kind of thing, which are, in some sense, incompatible. I will not say contradictory, but incompatible in the sense that they have different intuition between these two uh, models, these two kinds of models of the theory. Let me go uh, now to the last uh, part of my talk, the rise and fall of the axiomatic method. So the axiomatic method was very popular um, during the first half of the 20th century. And uh, as I was saying, um, even if we if we had a look at this uh, quotation by Einstein, that uh, it was it, that really a science, uh, any kind of things can be axiomatized, that we need to axiomatize. Some people have been working in this direction uh, to make axiomatization of physics, in particular, um, Patrick Supers, we organize, uh, he, he organized a big meeting about axiomatic method at Stanford University in the 50s, and people were, were trying to axiomatize not only uh, physics, but also uh, biology, um, soci social science, and something like that. So at this time, it was quite popular. Nowadays, very difficult to find people working in this direction. Very few people are working in this direction in the direction of axiomatizing uh, different branch of science. Axiomatization, most of the time, does not appear. Can we say it's good or not? Dep it depends. But I think um, I've been working in uh, this uh, question of uh, axiomatic emptiness. Axiomatic emptiness uh, does, not mean, does not mean that we are rejecting the axiomatic method. It means that we are starting <clears throat> for a ground. We are starting to work uh, in a more fundamental stage where uh, we don't have axiom. This was promoted in mathematics by, uh, especially uh, in universal algebra, by uh, Garrett Birkhoff. Because, um, so uh, algebra is uh, one of the most uh, important branch of mathematics. And uh, so people were, st were studying each time more and more abstract structure, and they wanted to find some general laws for this kind of structure. And then Birkhoff, uh, in the 30s, he defined uh, an algebra just as a set with a family of operators and without any axioms. And he said, well, it was not possible to find axioms which are valid for all kind of uh, algebraic structure. And then, what can we do uh, if we don't have a, if we don't have action? We can do many things. It's more like conceptual. So Birkhoff, for example, was able to define what is uh, a subalgebra, an algebra, subalgebra, which is uh, uh, homomorphism, notion of morphism, so basic concept which are fundamental to study algebraic structure. And this this notion, this concept. They do, they, this, they do not depend on any axioms. So you don't need axiom to put this uh, notion concept forward. Then later on, we have this uh, nice book by uh, Louis Chanuel, Conceptual Mathematics, related with category theory. Because uh, <clears throat> even if in category theory there are some axioms, but there are very few axioms, the idea also is more like conceptual. You have some general concept, notion of morphism and so on. That has a basis to understand uh, all the different situations in mathematics. And uh, myself, I'm uh, working in logic, and I have uh, applied this, um, if I may say, I have been inspired by the idea of Birkhoff to make uh, a theory that I called universal logic in parallel with universal algebra, also where we are not using any axiom <coughs> to describe what is reasoning. Because during many centuries, people say, well, we have some basic principles, principle laws for reasoning, principle of excluded middle, principle of uh, non-contradiction, uh, principle of identity, and so on. Well, we have to see up to which point these are really 
basis of our reasoning. We don't know exactly. So the idea is to start with a very general approach where we don't have any axiom. And then we can, from that, from this point of view, we can study different specific situation where we have principle of contradiction or not. We are, we are open to any kind of um, possibility. But we are making a theory. We are developing concepts to understand all these notions. So no axiom at this point or so, no axiom. And this is very important to, know how, to have no axiom in logic, because logic, in principle, would be uh, something fundamental for, for this question of, of axiom. Logic and methodology of science, all these all this, uh, things, uh, all this perspective which was developed at the beginning of the 20th century was related with logic and so on. OK, so uh, that's it. I don't know if we have time for a discussion or. Yeah, uh, Jean, if there are some questions uh, in the chat, uh, we uh, also po can, uh, posted there some questions from uh, YouTube uh, translate, uh, uh, transaction, tag, so you can find them all there. I see the question on the chat. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Do you see them? Uh, no, because on, on my screen, I don't see the chat. Oh, you, uh, uh, if you switch off your uh, ah, demonstration yeah. of your screen, you ah, will yeah. see the chat. Let me see, yeah. Uh huh, okay. Uh, okay. And now uh, the chat, where is the chat? The chat is uh, below in the line, the chat, with a white cloud. White cloud. <laughs> Reaction. Well, I don't see it. Uh, would you like me to read the questions for you? Yeah, maybe it's better because then uh, I cannot, I cannot okay. answer you. Because I don't, I cannot, I cannot read this. I don't see where they are. I convert. Ah, okay. Now, no. You see them. Okay. Uh, I see them. I don't, but I don't understand. Oh, uh, well. You can start from the end and from go end. up till. <laughs> okay, so uh, at the end, so it's always a question from Mother Oda. Newton theory does not characterize a single thing either and is not supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. okay, but it's so a it's remark. not a question, it's <laughs> a remark. <laughs> now, Otavio, I think he's just gone, but how about existential axioms such as the infinity axiom in ZD that states that there is an infinite set? Well, that's a. Uh, <clears throat> That's an interesting question. Zero is not an axiom, I would say. Uh, well, first element, uh, there is a first element, but it's a mixture, I would say, the, the question of zero. Um, it's a mixture between existential and quantifier, uh, uh, between ex existential and universal, because you say there is something, there is an object, and all these other objects are uh, bigger than zero. So it's a mixture of, um, of uh, existential universal. The question of infinity, it can be uh, defined in different way. The uh, question of infinity. Infinity, um, I don't think that infinity is something uh, really uh, existential. I don't think so. Uh, so, but it's true that you can say, well, infinity is something that it's, uh, it's, is it something which is negative? How we can define infinite? Well, there is a lot of things. Uh, as I was saying in my uh, at the beginning of my talk, there is many things to say about uh, still uh, many things to say about uh, this notion of axiom. So uh, I would like to uh, uh, exactly. Anything, I mean, if I go on, I will uh, go on to work on that. And I think this. Uh, this question by Otavio are interesting to, to discuss these two axi axioms. I think it's worth to do that, about infinity, infinity, and zero. Uh, then, uh, do we have really over question? There is one more just over Otavio's question, and that's it, I think. By Fernando, uh, have you already seen the dictionary for the French cover? It's an image of a word cloud. 
<laughs> it's very good. No? <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm happy to know that. I, I, I know, of course, because uh, Fernando is one of my colleagues here in Rio. I know the dictionary, the anthology, but I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know this cover. Uh, a word, so a word club made from the Russian word Pravda. We have to see what, what we have in this cloud. I'm curious to see. No? But it shows that uh, the notion of cloud, of cloud, is, uh, is quite interesting. Yeah. That's it. Thank you.